is from the um, is from the uh, Cent National Center for NBS Medicine. He's a medical doctor, and um, the National Center for NBC Medicine is responsible for medical preparedness against nuclear, chemical, and biological agents in Norway. Please welcome uh, Arne Brock Brandsetter. Thank the organizers for inviting me to speak on the role of the health sector in response planning for bioterror. And I'm here to give you the Norwegian perspective. And I emphasize I'm giving you the perspective from the Norwegian health services. And of course, there are many actors in the field. Defense is one, uh, police is another one, and there are several other ones. But this is going to be the health perspective. Um, my first message to you today is that the management of serious infectious diseases is very much the same, whether it is caused by natural infection, accident, or by a terror. The, um, the Norwegian health services, they provide good diagnostic services and good treatment for serious infections every day. And the knowledge and the experience of the healthcare workers in this field is also very relevant to bioterror. So I would say that in general, the Norwegian health services are well prepared for management of serious infections. However, we do meet some challenges in certain circumstances. And this could be uh, situations where we are faced with large epidemics. And uh, in 2009, we were faced with the last uh, pandemic, as you know, and you know we, we tried to respond as best as possible to that. Uh, and that has given us experience also how to ha handle other events, other outbreaks. And I'll, co I'll come back to that. Uh, of course, there are also challenges for certain serious transmissible infections that we see very rarely in the Norwegian healthcare system. For example, one case of Ebola uh, hemorrhagic um, fever would be a great challenge for us to handle. And there are also uh, challenges for situations which we meet very seldomly, what I've called here unusual circumstances. And bioterror is certainly one of these. Another one would be a major accident in a laboratory handling these type of dangerous agents. Um, my, my second main message to you today is that preparedness for natural infections and infections caused by accidents is also preparedness for bioterrorism. Uh, and um, I dare to say that recent outbreaks have really helped improve uh, uh, the health services preparedness. Uh, avian flu broke out in Hong Kong in 1997 uh, and then later spread, as you know, to many countries around the world and has since then caused several hundreds of deaths. Fortunately, this infection does not transmit very easily from person to person. But nevertheless, there has been fear for a long time that this virus was going to mutate and become more trans trans transmissible and become the next pandemic. Um, and, uh, and we have seen recently that uh, research on this virus has caused uh, great controversy within the, in, within the scientific wor world, whether uh, these uh, mutations that code for increased transmissibility should be published uh, and become available for a wider audience. And Professor Bronson has already alluded to that. But we know now today that, uh, well, so far, uh, this has not uh, mutated in, into a um, pandemic virus. In the meantime, in 2003, we were met with another uh, huge challenge when, um, when SARS broke out. Uh, and you will remember that, um, I'm sorry for that. You will remember that um, the healthcare services around the world and uh, also in Norway mounted a massive response to fight that uh, epidemic. And the WHO could, could declare that this epidemic was over uh, less than half a year after it broke out. In 2009, we were challenged for the, for the first time, um, and we, our pandemic plan was put to a test. And we know that that um, was a test which we did very well in, in certain respects, but there has also, also been criticism 
regarding our response to that. But I think on the, on the whole, I think the health services responded quite well. We were able to treat and diagnose the patients that came to our attention. And, and these days, and fairly recently, we may be f facing a new problem by, by, by way of this new coronavirus which has been identified in the Middle East. This is a SARS-like virus, but fortunately it seems to transmit less easily between individuals than SARS did. So far there have been nine cases of this virus which causes serious lung infections and, and three deaths, also in Europe. In Norway, few, if any, of the health services will have separate plans that deal specifically with bioterrorism. As for preparedness plans for pandemic influenza, preparedness against bioterrorism should be an integral part of the general preparedness plan for these services. We have two national plans that are also relevant to our preparedness against bioterrorism. I have already alluded to the national preparedness plan for pandemic influenza. This is uh, now under revision, but we have a national plan, or we also have a national plan against smallpox, which is less well known. And you may wonder why do we have a plan against smallpox? Well, the reason for that is that although smallpox was declared eradicated by the WHO in 1980, we know that there are at least two repositories of this virus around the world. There is one in the US and there is one in Russia, officially sanctioned by the WHO, although there has been a lot of discussion whether that is a good idea, whether we should also um, get rid of these last sources of the virus. The problem is that we do not know for sure that there are not also other freezers around the world that contain this virus and that it might uh, come into the hands of terrorists. And that's why we have this smallpox, smallpox plan. The problem with this plan in Norway is that it is not fully operative, unfortunately, and the NBC Center has proposed a new national plan which will also include other serious infectious diseases. We believe that is a better way of looking at this problem and that this, um, this, uh, this kind of serious epidemic infectious diseases um, should uh, uh, also cover bioterrorism. The best solution in dealing with many problems in life and also at work is, um, is prevention. Uh, the health care services are rather good at preventing ordinary infections, I would say, you might disagree, by way of pharmacological or non-pharmacological measures. By pharmacological measures, I mean such things as antibiotics and mainly vaccines. By non-pharmacological non measures, I mean such things as washing hands, disinfecting hands, isolating uh, pa patients with infections from healthy patients, from pa patients without infections. However, the health services are much less relevant when it comes to prevention of bioterrorism. Uh, the understanding of the factors that influence a man or a woman to decide to perform an act of bioterrorism is the job of the social scientist. Prevention of bioterror, uh, bioterror acts is the job of the police or perhaps uh, the, our national defense. However, health services and others do have a role in preventing potential bioterrorists access to biolog biological agents in laboratories. And this is what we call biosecurity, and which has already been mentioned by the previous speakers. And this, in this way, we can contribute by preventing that people uh, without uh, reason enter our labs and, and can obtain infectious agents that way. I'll just go quickly over the next few slides because this has already been covered by the previous two speakers. But I would just say that there are very few uh, incidents of bioterror in recent time. Uh, of course, looking backward is not always good for pred predict predicting the future. But nevertheless, I think it is fair to say that we have had very few acts of bioterrorism. One in 1984 in Oregon, we've already heard about the Salmonella outbreak. And you, I think the 1990s attempts with the using anthrax and botulism toxin in Japan by the Amish and Riku sect has not been mentioned. Fortunately, they failed, but they had a great success from their perspective in 1995 when they, able to, when they were able to injure a lot of people with the neurogas sarin. Actually, they, many people died. 
and the uh, anthrax outbreaks in 2001 in the US has already been well covered, so I'll skip that one. So I think, at least from, uh, from our perspective, I think it is fair to say that the probability for bioterror is low. But, has, but as has already been pointed out, the risk that we need to take into account is a function of probability and the consequence of something happen, happening. Although the probability is low, because the consequence may be devastating for the society, we need to take this risk seriously. And therefore, preparedness plans and preparedness in general need to take account of bioterrorism. The, the former US, the former um, head of the US Department of Homeland Security, uh, Michael Chertoff, was asked in 2009, what is the uh, single biggest threat to the US today? And his response then was, I worry most about a biological attack. The acceleration of know-how is constantly increasing. And I would, he, did, he didn't say that in the interview, but I would expect that he was not so much worried because of the probability of an attack was extremely high, but, it is, but it, his worry was more uh, in how to face an unknown threat. We don't know what, what this biological threat will be like. But what we know with that is that it is possible to harm society very severely with biological agents. And this slide is just to remind us all what we are actually talking about. What are the, the ter bioterrorists using? We're talking in biological, about biological agents, which I and um, most people define as living microorganisms and their toxins. And um, on, uh, on this slide, we see some examples of these uh, uh, biological agents. On the bottom here, we see the botulism bacteria, which produces a very um, uh, uh, serious damaging uh, toxin. This is mostly, it is the most lethal toxin known, known to man. It is estimated that, at least in theory, one gram of this toxin can kill one million people. Uh, this, is an example, this example here shows the Ebola virus, which is also on the list of potential uh, bioterrorist uh, threats. Uh, and this is a smallpox virus as seen under the um, electron microscope. Uh, and these are, this is the anthrax bacteria. For a bioterrorist to cause harm, he not only needs to acquire biological agents, but he also, to, also needs to uh, produce these in large quantities, and he needs some way of spreading them in an effective way that results in infection. This can be achieved by three main methods. One is by aerosol, that is uh, uh, by air, uh, and people then get infected by inhaling the biological agents into their lungs, and that will usually uh, res uh, result in severe uh, lung injury, pneumonia, with these agents that we are most concerned about. A second method is to spread the agent by water or food, uh, we fear that our, the, the, our, uh, our water reservoirs might be, become infected, for example, or that food might become infected. And then we get, of course, the infection enters through the mouth and it can cause gastroenteritis, diarrhea, or, uh, or severe systemic infections with blood poisoning and so on. And the last um, main way of spreading these organisms is by spread putting it on surfaces. So that people either get directly infected to the skin, they get um, skin infections, or they might secondarily infect themselves by putting fingers into the mouth and so on. On this uh, following slides, I would just give you a few examples of the diseases that we are talking about. Uh, but I would first like to point out that not all of these biological threat agents are transmissible between uh, between people, from, that is from person to person. I'd just like to give you a few examples, uh, and, and, the, and this, these examples on the first slide, they are highly transmissible between people, as you, as you, as you will soon learn. The smallpox virus, you, we've all heard about. I've, probably none of us have seen it uh, in real life. And the, and the photograph here, on, here is uh, showing a young girl 
with this severe case of smallpox. And this is a disease which we fear so much because it has a case fatality. It is estimated that roughly a one in three will die of this disease. This is a chest x-ray of a patient with a pneumonic plague, that is the pest in Norwegian, lungepest. Uh, and we can see these uh, infiltrates here on the chest x-ray showing the severe complication of this agent. And the two photographs on the right, they show a patient with a severe case of uh, hemorrhagic fever. See the bleeding in the eyes and also the huge bruise marks on the arm as a result of, uh, of, of hemorrhage. Uh, on this side, side, I just saw a few, few, um, a few photographs of, um, of diseases that are not transmittable between um, people from person to person. The first, the first three slides here uh, are cases of tularemia. This is from a patient who died with, with severe um, pulmonary tularemia, that is pneumonia uh, in the lung. And these are Norwegian cases of tularemia uh, with, with skin infection and swollen lymph nodes. And fortunately, fortunately for Norway, we only have this less severe form of tularemia in Norway. But we do see tularemia cases fairly regularly in the hospital. The photographs there on the right uh, are cases of anthrax with skin manifestations pulmonary manifest manifestations, and also meningitis in a patient who died. This actually was in a Norwegian drug addict who, who got anthrax some years ago and died from this infection. Serious infections, but they are, in a way, they are easier to handle because they are not transmissible from person to person. Now, as has already been um, said by some of both previous speakers, I believe, is that the bioterrorist's main aim is to cause uh, fear. And most threats, they are, are false. And we can usually leave these to the police to sort out. Sometimes they need the assistance of the health services to analyze, for example, the content of white powders. And this is a fairly regular matter here in, here in Oslo. And most of the time, they don't get media attention. However, what we fear most is um, covert threats, that is, um, um, the, the terror is not declaring their intention, but just quietly spreading the biological agents. If no warning is given by the bioterrorist, it is more likely that many will become infected before we know what we are dealing with. And for early suspicion and mitigation of terrorist acts, we need vigilant healthcare workers in our health services. Uh, and I would claim that the health services uh, are the last line of defense against bioterrorism. That is when prevention has failed. In order to reduce the consequences of a biological attack, it is vital that the health services are able to mount a rapid response to, to the threat. And I put five points here on this slide. We need to rapidly be able to diagnose the disease and identify the agent so we know exactly what we're dealing with. As soon as we get suspicion that this might be bioterrorism, bioterror we, meet, we, meet to re, we need to report rapidly. And this is really one point where it's slightly different from handling ordinary infections because the way we report here would be slightly different. So of course, it, uh, paramount that the police rapidly uh, are warned about uh, our suspicion of bioterrorism. We need to provide rapid treatment, effective treatment. We need to prevent further transmission of the disease. And we need to offer preventive treatment to, um, to risk groups. Uh, rapid detection of diseases as a result of an act of bioterrorism can only be achieved if healthcare workers have a high level of awareness of bioterrorism as a potential threat. Vigilant physicians will think of bioterrorism as a possibility if a disease occurs in the patients who have not ri no risk of that disease. For example, tularemia, or Hydropest in Norwegian, is a relatively common disease in hunters and people who drink well water or live in close contact with nature. However, if an office worker, perhaps a government employee, without such risk factors, come down with tularemia, bioterrorism should be suspected. Alternatively, it might be something unusual about the biological agent. 
it, it might be that it has, of course, it might be one of the um, uh, biological agents which is on the list of, of, of bioterrorist agents. Or it could be that there is something peculiar about this organism. Maybe it has a different resistance pattern from what we're used to. The, the ordinary antibiotics don't work. Then we should start thinking about bioterrorism as at least one possibility. Or there could be an atypi uh, atypical outbreak. Um, it could be that the, uh, the outbreak occurs in a population which is where this type of outbreak is rarely seen. Or it could be that the, the, the way that the outbreak develops is atypical. It could be we have a more rapid increase in cases than what, what is normally seen with an organism. Or it could be that we have several outbreaks in different parts of the countries. And vigilant epidemiologists might help us to think of bioterrorism in these cases at an early stage. Our ability to effectively treat infections that are a result of bioterror act will depend on several factors. Of course, it will depend on the cause of the disease. Uh, and not all of these diseases, they can be treated. For example, for smallpox, we do not have any antibiotics that work. The same for Ebola. So um, that's one thing. But uh, of course, the other worry is that bioterrorists might be able to genetically modify organisms so that they don't, are no longer uh, sensitive to the, um, uh, to the um, antibiotics that we normally use. And anthrax is a case of that when that was suspected at an early age. I, I think in, in, the, in the CDC guidelines, they say ciprofloxacin is still the first choice uh, in treating this disease, although it is a really penicillin-sensitive drug um, uh, organism. Uh, and of course, it is important that we are uh, for success of treatment. It's, it's important that we diagnose early. If if the uh, if we diagnose a, a case of anthrax after the patient has ill with new um, pulmonary anthrax for three days, for example, our chances of success of curing that patient are very small. However, if we, if we sus suspect that on the first day uh, of admittance, then we can probably cure that patient. And of course, there's also the question of the number of patients that become ill. The healthcare services can become overwhelmed uh, we, uh, so, that we're not be able to, so that we're not able to treat uh, a lot of severe, se severely ill patients at the same time. Uh, and also, of course, uh, for some diseases, it's possible that we might run out of drugs. Uh, as soon as we know that we are faced with a bioterror attack, the health service will need to to decide what can be done to prevent further transmission. Uh, and, and these are s some measures that one, can, one should consider. One is quarantine. That is one measure which is actually very rarely used in modern medicine. Uh, but it's something that one considers. By quarantine, we mean to isolate people who have been exposed to biological agents or who might have been exposed to biological agents and, and separating them from the rest of the population for the incubation period for that disease so that if they be, do become ill, they will not transmit it to others. Uh, the, the second measure is something that we use in the hospital every day, that's isolation of patients. That means that we isolate patients that are actually ill and who are contagious. And this is, uh, this, these photographs are taken from um, the Department of Infectious Diseases at Oslo University Hospital. Uh, and this is how we usually dress up to prevent, air, uh, to, to prevent healthcare workers from becoming infected with airborne infections. We also have an um, isolation, um, uh, isolation unit for uh, highly infectious diseases at our hospital. Another aspect that needs to be addressed in the face of bioterror is the use of prophylactic measures. That is, interventions that can be carried out to prevent people who may have been exposed from becoming ill. And um, we have, we, for this purpose, we can use both vaccines and antibiotics. Um, for, uh, for smallpox in Norway, we have a fairly large stockpile, but this is an old generation, it's first generation um, um, smallpox vaccine, which is, um, ha has uh, relatively severe potential side effects. There is a new vaccine now, which we so far not bought in large quantities, <coughs> but that's also under consideration. Uh, vaccines can be given after exposure to, for example, smallpox and for some other diseases. 
but um, but they can uh, also be give, given before to prevent people from becoming infected who are likely to become infected in the future. And the same for antibiotics. We can we use antibiotics for people who have been, have been exposed. We do that fairly fairly regularly when we um, when we suspect that we might have people who have been infected with the anthrax through powders. Although most of the time we're able to stop this prophylaxis soon when it becomes clear that the powder does not con contain anthrax. Or it is also impossible in, in special cases to give it before we send people into an area where uh, which might be infected with an organism. Uh, and the last measure is here is decontamination. And that's something quite special for bioterrorism. And that's, we don't use that in ordinary infectious disease medicine. But by decontamination, we mean that people who have, might have been exposed to um, anthrax spores uh, through powders, for example, and uh, that they remove their clothes and that, and that they, they preferably also have a shower. And this is how it can be done with the assistance of the fire services if this happened somewhere in the city or in an outdoor location. In the hospital uh, where I work, we also have special decontamination tents, which can be put up uh, before taking patients who have, might have been contaminated into the hospital. And towards the, towards the end of this talk, I would uh, like to highlight some important resources in bioterror preparedness in Norway. And I will focus here on the health healthcare resources. As I mentioned in, in my introduction, there are many other players in this field as well. But I think it's fair to mention the Norwegian Institute of Public Health first, because this is where we have both the National Microbiological Preparedness Lab and the uh, System for Surveillance of Communicable Diseases is there. There is a field epidemiology outreach team that can go out and investigate outbreaks. And it is also the the institution responsible for procurement of uh, a vaccine and delivery of vaccines in Norway. The primary health care in the counties has responsibility for implementing preventive measures, offer diagnostic services and treatment, including referral to hospital. And uh, in, in hospitals, we are used to dealing with uh, serious infections and even small outbreaks fairly regularly. Uh, and so most, in most hospitals around the country, there will be doctors that know about these infectious disease diseases, although the awareness could probably be even higher than it is today. But I would just like to mention the isolation ward for highly infectious disease diseases, which is located at Oslo University Hospital. And you will see we use very similar suits there. This is from one of our um, um, training, one of our practice sessions. And we practice regular, regularly to receive this kind of patients. And also at the uh, Oslo University Hospital is the Norwegian Center for MDC Medicine, where I work. Um, we are the national treatment center for injuries caused by nuclear radiation, biological agents, and chemical agents. And biological agents and bioterrorism is clo closely related, as will probably be clear, be, be clear from this talk. The MDC Center can be contacted 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, by the healthcare services, and we also serve as advisors for the health service and the um, government authorities. And finally, I would just like to conclude. No, the Norwegian health services are well prepared for diagnosis and treating, perhaps I should say, ordinary infectious diseases. Uh, preparedness for, infectious, uh, uh, for, for infections caused by natural transmission and accidents is also preparedness for bioterrorism. The probability of bioterror is low, but the risk cannot be ignored and should be taken seriously. And the health services they need to include bioterror in their preparedness plans. Thank you.